Andrew Lowney was interviewed a lot at the height of the publicity for Trader King. And a lot of those interviews were conducted by Zoom because it was in the pandemic. And I actually happened to see one of those interviews and he said a very interesting thing. The interviewer was congratulating him for basically bringing this work to light. The fact that he had written such an informed and provable work from primary sources. And Andrew Lowney said, well, you know, you can't congratulate me too much because a lot of this information was actually available many, many, many years ago. And many authors have actually written books on this subject. But he said it's interesting that a lot of these authors didn't add two and two and make four. They added two and two and made three. And he said the only difference with him was, was that he told the story he found. Now, admittedly, he did have access to, you know, sort of new access to further information and more uh, modern released archives. But the Marburg files, for example, which were later known as the Windsor files, they were readily available. And so a lot of the books that came out prior to Andrew Lowney's could have told the story, but they chose not to. Now, I guess it's only conjecture why. Was it fear? Was it too big a story to tell? Was it just too overwhelming? Were they fearful about repercussions? Who knows? Now, Andrew Lowney probably felt that he had the academic chops to back all this up. Maybe that was why he was so brave. It's all very well to write a book, but you've got to be able to sort of argue that book when you're being questioned about it. You've got to be very, very sure about your material. And he was very sure. It's really interesting that a lot of his interviews are almost like lectures history lectures, and they're absolutely fascinating. But it gives a lot of veracity to what he's saying. But there's a lot of veracity to what he's saying anyway, because most of his book is written from accessing primary sources in files and archives. And so all of it is, well, a large majority of it is provable and factual and can be tracked down to solid information. Now, we're not going to be talking about Andrew Lowney's book today. We're going to be talking about those authors prior to him who did add two and two and make three. I thought it would be fascinating to go back and see what they put in, what they left out. And in particular, someone who left out a lot was a fascist fangirl called Diana Mosley. Now, why do I call her a fascist fangirl? Well, <laughs> I'm about to tell you. Ooh, she was one of the Mitford daughters and she was considered one of the most beautiful. Actually, when she came out for her debut season, she was just considered the greatest beauty and she caught the eye of Brian Guinness, who was heir to the Bury fortune. And they actually managed to convince their parents to let them wed. And there they were gallivanting around gay, rich things. In 1929, it was the wedding of the century. And they were on a very tidy income of 20000 a year. They had multiple homes. They traveled extensively. And really, you just couldn't think of a better life. Now, Diana had several children with Brian but it was sort of post her second child when she went to a party and she met a very charismatic young man called Oswald Mosley. Now, Oswald Mosley was making quite a name for himself in the early 30s because he was speaking out against unemployment and he was speaking out with the message of action and he was the alternative voice, the voice that promised a solution. And he sort of went from the Conservative Party to the Labour Party to creating his own British Union of Fascists. And when Diana Mosley met him, she was actually, like I said, a bit of a fascist fangirl anyway. She attended the Nuremberg rallies and she was also present at the Berlin Olympics as a guest of the man himself. So Oswald would have been quite captivated, I would imagine, with her social connections. And she was captivated, she said, by his politics and his unique ideas and his unique solutions. 
Now, I may seem a little contemptuous because I don't like the woman. I've, I've seen several interviews with her. I find her to be a bit of a bully. I mean, she's passed away now, so I've, I've found that she was a bit of a bully. In particular, I saw an interview she gave where she was quite elderly and it was on Thames TV. It was called The Good Afternoon Show. And I don't know the poor hapless interviewer that <laughs> interviewed Diana Mosley. But oh, she was a piece of work. She's sort of one of those bullying sort of people that she could barely contain her contempt. She had a thin, thinly veiled look of disdain for this interviewer. And she gave shorter than expected answers, although always scrupulously polite, sort of looking down her nose at the interviewer every chance she got. And she left these rather long pauses. Now, as you know, a bully relies on a pause because it can make people feel really uncomfortable. The first instinct is to try and fill in the gap. And that's what this interviewer did in a very fawning sort of way. I mean, she was almost complimenting her for being thrown into Holloway Jail during World War II because she was considered to be treasonous and also a danger to Great Britain. Um, and she was asking her about it like, oh, and so you were thrown into Holloway Jail for your beliefs? Had it? Oh, it was, it was really quite sickening. And you could tell that Diana Mosley was quite getting off on all this. You could also see that she really hadn't changed any of her views. She was very careful to sort of couch her views in socially acceptable ways, but they were still there. They were still blatantly there. So you might ask, why go over this book then that is going to be so obviously biased? Well, there are juicy little tidbits in Diana Mosley's book that I did not find in Andrew Lowney's and I did not find in Andrew Morton's. And they're very informative. One of the extraordinary things in Diana Mosley's book, you would expect her to be sort of quite sneery about the royal family. That's fine. You know, that's fine. That's an opinion. But she was quite extraordinary because she almost, well, she did blame the Duchess of Windsor's suffering in the last nine years of her life. Now, she was in and out of consciousness. She never left her bedroom. She wasn't allowed any friends to visit. She was looked after really well. She had medical attention. She had a lawyer that took care of her interests. And she also had her faithful French butler and her housekeeper. Now, Diana Mosley did actually visit her and she was a bit concerned because although she appeared to be unconscious, she seemed to have a look of pain or on her face when she looked in on her in her bedroom. And she complained to the attending physicians that she was concerned about this and that she was concerned that she might be in pain. Now, she was reassured that she wasn't in pain, but she said she had seen other unconscious people being given a pain relief injection and their facial expression actually changing and relaxing. So she wasn't entirely convinced. But only being a friend, she didn't have any punch. She couldn't actually demand any alternative medical treatment for her friend. She didn't have any standing in that way. She didn't have any legal power. But there was a family that could have helped. There was a family that could have intervened and did have some standing and legal power to actually demand some alternative form of medical treatment. And that was her in-laws, the royal family. And Diana Mosley is quite damning about the fact that they just left her lying in this state year after year after year without checking on her or without, you know, taking any steps to ensure she was receiving the very best medical care. Now, can we blame them for that? Because they knew what Andrew Lowney sets out in his book, that they were, you know, collaborators of the enemy during World War II. So really, would they go out of their way? I don't think so. But let's read what Diana Mosley said about that time and her opinion about their responsibility. The Duchess had, of course, many in-law relations, the royal family in England. They had the right to see her and, if necessary, make suggestions. It seemed to me 
But if a conference of doctors, English, French and American, were called, something more humane may have resulted. I guess we'll never know. But that was the opinion of Diana Mosley, who was a great friend of Wallace. It's really interesting, too, at the start of the book that Diana Mosley talks about a dinner party that they all attended in the 1960s, rather grand affair. And one of the guests asked this question to everyone around the table. What would you wish for if you could have one wish? And of course, there were answers, variations on health and wealth and things like that. And the Duke of Windsor actually remained silent until he was prodded by the Duchess. Tell us what you would wish for, she said. You was the reply. And then she said that nobody who knew them doubted that this answer was simply the truth. She was all the world to him. Now, that's amusing to me because <laughs> the one thing I noticed was the fact that Wallace was the one that prompted him <laughs> to say, well, what would you wish for? And I often wonder whether it was accompanied with a kick under the table. But according to Diana Mosley, that's not the case, that there was a deep and everlasting love between them. And that is the point of her memoir. Also, as I said, not mentioned in Diana Mosley's book is the fact that Wallace did meet Ribbentrop and also befriended a German spy while she was living in her block of flats or units with her husband, Ernest Simpson. It's also interesting that she was being followed by MI5 and being spied on way, way, way back at the very beginning of her romance with the Prince of Wales. Until reality hit, and when she started to get a bit of pushback, when she realised that people didn't want her to become the Queen Consort, when she realised that he could actually be forced to abdicate and that it was a real possibility, she tried to get out of it desperately. She ran scared. When reality hit, it hit hard and she didn't want any part of it. It was all very well to have a lot of fun, but when it was getting real, she actually just wanted to run back to her husband, Ernest, and have a quiet life and leave the king to do his king thing. But King Edward was having none of it. He, there was no way he was letting her go. Uh, I think that he really viewed her as the way out of something that he never wanted to do. He, he enjoyed the cheers, he enjoyed the adoration, he enjoyed being considered a man of the people, but he also loved his golf. He also loved his holidays. He loved his luxury. He loved the deference that he got from everybody, but he didn't really love doing the real hard, boring work. Sounds like someone else I know. So there's a little bit in Diana Mosley's book about that time where Wallace was absolutely terrified. She could feel the net closing in on her and she was just looking for an escape. She was really frightened. She felt the trap closing. She says she often reproached herself for not leaving England there and then. She was prevented from doing so by his strong desire that she should stay and by the near certainty that if she did go, he would follow, like a doting mallard, as Shakespeare said of Antony. And he would have too. He just would have chucked it all in and followed her all over the world like a little lovesick puppy. One takeaway I do have, though, from Diana Mosley's book is the feeling that you're dealing with quite a lot of sort of vapid, soulless people that are a little bit bored. It's like seeing their financial needs have been met, that there is a vacuum then of just looking for power where they can. And I think World War II would have come across as sort of a big inconvenience because I think they used to like the cosplay aspect of all these little rallies and all these little power plays and all their overseas connections. But when it started to get real, I think it became a little more inconvenient. But there's one thing that Andrew Lowney is right, particularly when it comes to Diana Mosley's book. It left a lot of the real story out. And it is fascinating just from that point of view. 
It is such a whitewash. It is such a perfect propaganda piece. Let me know what you think down below. Let me know if you've actually read Diana Mosley's book. And in my next video, I'll have a look at Andrew Morton's. See you then. Bye.